Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Perimeter Institute and the Inspiring Future Women in Science Conference. My name is Kelly Foyle, and I'm a physicist and member of Perimeter's educational outreach team. It's tremendously inspiring to see a room like this filled with uh, young women who are curious about the world, passionate about science, and eager to make important contributions. I was just chatting briefly with some of you, and uh, I could see that there's a lot of love for science, and maybe a little confusion on what's next, how do I move forward in my career. So hopefully today's session is going to um, at least give you that passion and energy to keep going. Maybe it won't answer all your questions, but some of them. So thank you all for coming. You are the future of women in science, and the conference is about you, and it's for you. I'm really eager to hear your comments and questions throughout this session. We've got a really exciting morning ahead. We're honored to have some amazing women with us today who followed a STEM career, and they're here to support and help to contribute to make this event a wonderful morning. They're going to be sharing their stories on how they pursued their paths and offering you advice and food for thought on your career ahead. In the next few hours, you're going to have the opportunity to learn as much as you can from the experience of women who have come before you. Much of science, too, involves building on the work done before and learning from the experience of others. So it's in that spirit of understanding and learning from what has come before that I would also like to acknowledge that we're on the traditional territory of the neutral Ashinanabwe and Haudenosaunee peoples. Perimeter is situated on the Haldeman Tract, the land promised to the Six Nations that includes six miles on each side of the Grand River. As a young woman living in Canada, you are impacted by all that has come before you, but you also have the opportunity to learn from experiences and perspectives of a truly diverse community. I encourage you to ask questions and remain open to the thoughts and reflections and wisdoms of others while considering your own path for the future. So we're going to go over briefly how this morning is going to work. Uh, first, we're going to have a special welcome address from a special guest. And then we're going to hear from two or three of our speak two of the three of our speakers. Each will be followed by an opportunity to ask questions. After the first two speakers, we're going to have a panel discussion, and the panelists are going to discuss their lives as STEM professionals and ideally answer all of your amazing questions. Um, so most of the discussion is going to be driven by you. The panel discussion is then going to be followed by our final speaker, and then we're going to say goodbye to our online audience and move to the atrium for a speed mentoring session. So this is an opportunity for you to chat in small groups with a variety of STEM professionals. The mentors are really excited about sharing their experiences with you, um, so I'm sure it's going to be a fruitful um, session out in the atrium. So there's a lot ahead, so let's get started. Um, I'd like to introduce you to our first speaker, Dr. Mona Niemer. Dr. Mona Niemer is Canada's chief science advisor, reporting on scientific matters directly to the Prime Minister of Canada and to our Minister for Science. This helps in their decision making and shaping a brighter future for the entire country. Previously, Dr. Niemer was Vice President of Research at the University of Ottawa and Director of Molecular Genetics and Cardiac Regeneration Laboratory. With over 200 beating hearts in this theatre today, we can be thankful to Dr. Niemer for her work that contributed to the development of diagnostic tests for heart failure, plus other research. Among awards and honours, Dr. Niemer is a member of the Order of Canada and a Fellow of the Academy of Sciences of the Royal Society of Canada. Please welcome to Perimeter Stage for the first time, Canada's Chief Science Advisor, Dr. Mona Niemer. Thank you so much. Good morning, everyone. Bonjour tout le monde. Marhaba, guten tag. Any language you want. Thank you, John, Amy, Neil, and everyone here at Perimeter for inviting me. It is, like you said, my first visit, and I guess I've chosen the perfect day to be here uh, with you. Of course, I had heard a lot about the Perimeter Institute, a, a, a great, great institution, not only in Canada, but around the world, and, and uh, certainly something that we should all be very proud of. I had heard also about the architecture, and I was delighted to see it. Above all, I'm delighted to be in an institute for, uh, that's dedicated to physics. 
Well, I was uh, trained as a chemist. And as chemists, we always said that, that physicists were actually wannabe chemists. So <laughs> keep this in mind. <laughs> Seriously, I'm delighted to, to, be, to be here and uh, to see all the, these brilliant uh, women in the theater of ideas. I think you're going to have a lot of ideas and I hope you will enjoy uh, the day immensely. The day is about you. It's about present and future women in science and also in engineering. Engineering is, after all, applied sciences. To those of you joining us online from around the world, I say welcome, ahlan bikum. We're delighted to be connected with you for this wonderful International Women's Day celebration. So I, I wanna thank the Perimeter Institute for uh, hosting and facilitating uh, this day. In addition to the world leading research that they do that I mentioned before, I am uh, absolutely uh, delighted and impressed by the great center of science education and outreach. I think this is a, an activity that is certainly as important as the great science that happens uh, within the walls of the Institute and also throughout the world, I guess, uh, throughout our connections. Uh, Perimeter is a leader in providing opportunities to advance women. One of the Institute's great initiatives, the ME Northern Initiative, was created to ensure opportunities for women at all career stages, in research and in training. I understand that this year's Perimeter International Scholars Master level class consists of 31 top young minds, 14 of whom are women. Bravo, let's go girls. This is an important achievement because more women in science today means even more women in science tomorrow. It's not only good for women, it's actually good for society. Representation matters. Role models matter. It's important that we see ourselves reflected in the community of scientific leaders and achievers. You'll hear from many of them, and I urge you to take advantage of their presence. In my own work, having a female role model was one of the most important external influences on my career. The other being the great mentors who helped me along the way. In your education or in your career, there may be times when you find that you're the only woman in the room. You may at times be seriously challenged to find someone that you identify with. Well, hang in there because that's changing. The days of women being held back or excluded from science are over. Now more than ever, women are entering, remaining in, and revolutionizing the science fields. Today, I think, is a shining example of that. We're gonna have 20 women share their experience with you. And these women come from across disciplines, a surgeon, astrophysicist, ecologist, and engineer, even chemist, did I mention chemist, are among the speakers who will participate in our event today. So there is a bright future for all of you in some of the most challenging and exciting fields of the future. And today, you'll have a chance to dive in and learn more. This is a great opportunity for us all to reach out also across disciplines. This too is very important because addressing the major societal challenges and actually addressing our ambitions as a society requires multidisciplinary collaborative approaches. As many of you already know, STEM skills are applicable across disciplines but also across career choices. They help build resilience, solve problems. Can you imagine any career choice where you're not gonna have to do this? So these skills are transferable. They're transferable to new settings, so they build adaptability, which is critical for your future. So I hope you'll make the most of today's opportunity. 
ask questions, engage in discussion, and speak up. Make your voice heard. In your discussions, I also invite you to give some serious thought and reflection to the ways in which we might more quickly bring about change, bring about a system that supports all of us, a system that enables the best, regardless of gender, ethnicity, and culture, to participate fully in the advancement of science and the advancement of society. I am certain that together we will get there. So, happy International Women's Day, everyone. Have a great conference, and go girls, go. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Niemer. We are pleased to welcome the Linamar Corporation as the presenting sponsor of this conference. Based in Guelph, Linamar is a multi-billion dollar company operating 58 manufacturing facilities around the world. Linda Hasenfratz, our first speaker, is the CEO of Linamar, and she joined the company in 1990 and has worked in a variety of roles, including machine operator, general manager, and the president. She received her Honours Bachelor of Science and Executive MBA from the University of Western Ontario, and she has been named one of Automotive News 100 Leading Women in each year of its publication, and was inducted into the Canadian Hall of Business Fame in 2016. Please join me in welcoming Linda Hasenfratz. Well, good morning, everybody. It's a real thrill for me to be here uh, this morning as well. Uh, in a, what appears to be a continuing theme, I am also a chemistry graduate. So that's kind of interesting. But uh, what's great is there's just so many fantastic areas of science to study. Uh, and so many exciting careers that can build out of it. And I think Dr. Niemer uh, really hit it on the head when she said, uh, when she talked about the skills that you learn as a scientist, as an engineer, uh, you know, problem solving, critical thinking, all of these uh, skills are just so important and so many businesses are looking for them today that there is more and more demand for engineers and scientists in all kinds of areas that you wouldn't think of, including banking and uh, many different uh, institutions that are seeing the value of the skills that we all learned uh, in science. So uh, I'm here to al also uh, offer you uh, my welcome. We're thrilled to be the sponsors uh, of this uh, event. I think it's a great opportunity uh, for young women to see and hear from uh, from people who have uh, built careers in all kinds of different areas uh, of science. Uh, so as you heard, uh, I'm CEO of Linamar. We're a global diversified manufacturing company, uh, and uh, we're very involved in trying to encourage young people into STEM, and particularly uh, young women. Uh, in fact, uh, I like to give a little bit of advice when asked, which isn't often, uh, by, uh, by young people around uh, you know, what, what to do in terms of their education and careers. And so I say, I think you should pick an area of study that interests you, obviously, and a lot of people will give you that advice. They'll say, study what you love, uh, which is good advice, but it's not enough. I think it's only the first step. So first, you pick something that you think is uh, interesting. But then I would encourage you also to do a little bit of research on what are the different jobs that I could do studying that particular field. Uh, further, what is the demand for those jobs out there? I mean, are, people, are, you know, are those jobs that are in demand, or are, are we graduating too many people in, in that particular area, and that you can't get a job in that area when you graduate? and also research the earnings potential of that job, and just make sure it lines up with the lifestyle that you envision, right? Like, to me, it's just three boxes to check uh, to help you sort of plan out where, where I'm headed. And I think also, you shouldn't feel like, I need to decide today exactly what I'm gonna do for the rest of my life. What you can do is choose an area like STEM, which obviously you guys are interested in, or you wouldn't be here today, uh, and find and learn skills that you can use in a bunch of different areas and not worry about the fact that your life might take uh, a few uh, right or left turns along the way and you might end up someplace else. I think that's, that's completely fine. Uh, I think science uh, and technology are a great choice for anybody who's naturally curious 
about the world around them and how it works. And as I say, I think there's huge demand for these careers and great earnings potential. So I think it checks all those uh, boxes um, if it's an area that is of interest to you. Now, I know you're thinking, uh, are there many women in these areas of study? And I can happily tell you, actually, yes. Uh, the numbers are increasing all the time, which is just fantastic. We have 20 times the women in science, technology, engineering, and math that we did 20 years ago. And momentum just keeps building. As an example, the University of Toronto, you know, one of our uh, most respected academic institutions in this country, uh, with a world-recognized engineering program, has 42% women in their freshman class this year, which is amazing. 41% last year. So this is something that they have been you know, really working on and building up. So uh, women are a huge part of that program, and they aren't alone. You know, you look at the University of Waterloo, Western, uh, University of Guelph, McMaster, all of these uh, schools have really done a lot over the last decade to uh, to try to attract more women, and they're seeing the results, and the numbers are just getting uh, bigger all the time. Uh, in fact, Canadian women aged 25 to 34 held, hold 39% of all STEM degrees. That's based on a study in 2011, so I'm sure it's higher now, which is amazing, because there's just so many exciting career opportunities there. Uh, and great earnings potential as well. Women in STEM jobs earn 35% more than their counterparts that are in non-STEM uh, careers and 40% more than non-STEM men. Uh, so that's another great reason to head uh, in this direction. And it's why I and many others believe we should be doing everything we can to try to increase even more the representation of women in STEM. In fact, just today, myself and other members of the Canada-US Council for the Advancement of Women in Business and Entrepreneurship are releasing a report that includes specific recommendations uh, of what we think we should do to do just that, to increase women in STEM. Uh, through better communication, better sharing of some of these statistics that I've just uh, shared with you, changes to how we teach STEM, both within the, uh, the uh, secondary school or middle school uh, areas as well as in our universities and colleges, uh, sharing the many tools and programs that are out there. When we started doing our research in this area, we couldn't believe how many different great programs and tools and institutions are focused on exactly this. So uh, let's try and share those so we can all uh, learn from them. And then finally, our recommendations are also another thing that Dr. Niemer brought up, and that's around sharing great stories of role models that you guys can all connect to and be a, a little bit inspired to, to, to go towards. Today's all about that, right, is meeting some people in all kinds of different areas of STEM and what that can mean uh, to you. And I think uh, role models and mentors are just so important to helping uh, encourage more women into this area. When I started out in the automotive industry, as Dr. Neumer said, I was often the only woman in the room. But I, ha I can tell you that that has totally changed today. From 25 years ago when I first started in the automotive industry, there's so many more women uh, in every different area uh, of the business and every different level as well. I mean, the CEO of the third largest automotive company in the world, General Motors, is a woman, Mary Barra. She was my, actually my partner on the STEM report that we're releasing uh, today. Uh, so I think that's great. Now, how did I handle that? I'm often asked, and you know, I, I, I personally feel that the lack of women, uh, you know, around me wasn't, wasn't an issue for me. And I think that's another piece of advice I would give you. If you find yourself in a situation where you are the only woman or one of only a few, don't, uh, don't let that become an issue for you. It, it's, if you look for negative, you'll find it. So don't look for it. You know, I always, did, I chose to not sort of dial into that frequency, you know? And maybe there was people questioning, was I capable, was I not? But I always just got down to work and did my job, and I was capable and smart, and I worked hard, and, uh, you know, it doesn't take long for that to kind of become clear. And then, you know, after all, everybody's there to do a job, and we all got down to doing our work. So I think that's 
good advice for you if you're in that kind of uh, situation. You keep focused, you study hard, you work hard, do your job well, and people will recognize that. And they'll quickly forget about any preconceptions that they might have had about, uh, about you. Keep performing and I think you get attention. That's really the bottom, bottom line. Uh, I also think you young women are very lucky because you're living here in southwestern Ontario right in the heart of an incredible ecosystem that has developed around technology uh, and science in, and exciting areas like artificial intelligence and machine learning. You know, from institutions like the Perimeter Institute right here, focused on more fundamental thinking, to a, a really fantastic network of universities and colleges, incubators and accelerators to help you get your businesses started if that's something you want to do uh, is, um, is pretty exciting. You are also sitting in the second largest technology cluster in the world next to Silicon Valley. There's more technology startups and more technology workers and people focused in this field uh, than anywhere in the world except uh, Silicon Valley. That's pretty amazing, right? Uh, and you're living right in the middle of it, so take, take advantage of that. Uh, you know, in my opinion, there's never been a time frame where the technological evolution, thanks to technologies like artificial intelligence and machine learning, will transform so many industries and so many areas of companies. And it's another reason why more and more companies are looking for people uh, in the STEM fields to help manage that uh, transition. The fact is really in today's rapidly evolving technology, the demand for unskilled jobs will just continue to diminish and the demand for skilled people uh, is going to just increase. And we're experiencing that right, right now uh, with a, a constant need for more people in, in technology and in IT and engineering, uh, in quality, all the technical areas of our company. So you've all made the, first, the right first step by coming here today to learn a little bit about uh, different areas of science and from a great uh, lineup of speakers. I think you're going to love hearing uh, their stories in, uh, in a whole variety of different areas. So I hope you have a really fantastic morning. I hope that you learn something new. And ultimately, of course, I hope that you decide to pursue an education in science, technology, engineering, and math, and, uh, or math, and I hope that you convince at least one other young woman to do uh, the same. So with that, I believe we have just a few minutes for some questions. If anybody has, uh, has a question for me, I'd be happy to answer them. Thank you. Okay. Um, you know, you held so many diverse roles at Linamar, from machine operator all the way up to president. And I was just wondering, you know, was there a moment when you were first starting where you were like, one day I'm going to be president of this company? Or was there experience where you were like, this is, this is where I'm headed? Did you know? Or was it more smaller incremental steps along the way? Well, I think that uh, I had a great opportunity to see our business from a lot of different perspectives, which actually is another piece of advice that I would give you when you do uh, head out into your careers, is seeing a company from a bunch of different perspectives, whether it be shop floor, this is what we do to make money every single day, to working in engineering, to working in quality, accounting, uh, estimating. I worked in uh, almost every different area of our company and it was a, a fantastic experience that really helped me to see how the whole thing came together and I think it was that experience itself that you know made it easier for me to step into a general manager role when I started up uh, my first plant because I had a good understanding of how all those pieces work together so uh, it's something I would really recommend uh, as you're heading out into your careers to do a little bit of lateral move uh, and not be afraid of, you know, leaving one area and going to another and just experiencing what that's like and, uh, and, and uh, you know, g gaining that experience. Yeah, that's great advice. Yeah? Hi, um, my name is Naomi. I go to St. Mary's High School in Kitchener. And my question is, like, when you were growing up, what inspired you to follow, like, the science path? Like, did you have, like, any good, really great teachers that were really supportive or anything like that? 
Yeah, I'd say a couple things. I mean, one, I was always just naturally curious about science. I was naturally curious about the world around me and how things worked. I was one of those kids that asked all those questions that my mother couldn't answer. Uh, so, you know, I, I enjoyed those courses the more, most, but for sure I had great teachers uh, who really, you know, made science interesting, made math interesting, as if it wouldn't be. Uh, uh, but, uh, you know, and, and I think that's very important, right, to, uh, to helping to inspire you along, uh, along that path. Um, my father, uh, it, who's the founder of our, our company, is a machinist, so he's a, a technology tradesman uh, by, by trade. Uh, and he is incredibly naturally curious as well. So he, um, he inspired me in many ways uh, as well to be curious about the world around me and really encouraged me uh, to, uh, to study uh, science and, and engineering. Hi, um, my name is Savannah. I was wondering if you had any siblings or um, you know, uh, influences that were the same age as you who uh, helped you um, get involved in STEM and follow your career choice? I, I do have an older sister. She is, she is not uh, in STEM. She was the, sort of the more creative uh, half of the, of, of the family. And, and that was actually kind of good because you, know, it's, it, you always need both, right? You need a little, little of uh, each. Uh, so my sister was not. Um, but, you know, I had friends who were interested in science and technology as well. And as I say, I think my uh, parents and my teachers were probably the most influential towards me. And, and I think just my natural curiosity as well. Like, I mean, it was an area that I just naturally had an affinity, affinity to and really enjoyed. So it made it easy to decide to stick uh, in, in those areas. Take one last question. Hi, my name is Claire Francis, and I was wondering what sort of opportunities you think young girls like us should be taking advantage of right now to help us achieve like our goals like you did? Yeah, uh, I think that, um, uh, well, as, as I was saying in my formal comments, I think, you know, studying in the STEM areas, technology, IT, science, engineering, uh, are all uh, great areas for you guys to, to focus on. Uh, if you want to learn more, there's all kinds of different uh, programs out there. There are uh, summer programs, for instance, like University of Toronto has a summer program uh, for engineering. I can't remember if it's just for women or if it's more, more broad, but it's a great way for you to learn about engineering at the U of T and what that's all about and where, you know, the kind of things you would do and study and where you can take it so you can learn a little bit uh, more there. So uh, there are all, all kinds of those types of programs out there that can help uh, teach you more uh, about, uh, about what the different, uh, different options are. And today I think you'll learn uh, a lot as well. So uh, one of the recommendations that we're making as part of our report today is actually to create uh, a really comprehensive website portal uh, that's mobile friendly, that can give you all that information, that can show you all the different programs out there, connect you to all the different tools, connect you to mentors and role models, and help you do that career path, career path planning to say, oh, I'm really interested in biology, what does that mean? What are the jobs I can do? And like I was saying, what's the job demand and, and you know, the earnings for those jobs? Or, or you could start with, you know, a goal, like uh, I want to save the humpback whale, how do I do that? And okay, well these are, the kind of, these are the kind of things you could study, you could, you know, decide to focus on marine biology and here's what, you know, how you can do that and here's the schools that can help you achieve those goals. So that's a recommendation we're making today that, uh, you know, we're, ho we're hoping will become, uh, become a reality and be a great source of information for you and a lot of others. Thank you. Thank you so much. Linda. Thanks very much. I hope you have a great day. Our next speaker, Eugenia Duodu, combines her passion for science and her commitment to community development as the CEO of Visions of Science. Visions of Science is a charitable organization that aims to advance the educational achievements and career aspirations of youth from low-income and marginalized communities through meaningful engagement in STEM fields and research. Eugenia earned her PhD in chemistry uh, for research on the development of detection tools for diseases such as cancer and Alzheimer's. 
I will also note that Eugenia will be leaving right after the Q&A session, so please be sure to take advantage of this moment to ask questions um, as she won't be here during the speed mentoring session. The other speakers um, will be around um, so you can ask if we don't get a chance in the session today. Please join me in welcoming Eugenia. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm so excited to be here to talk to all of you um, about my story and just my journey. And that's what I want to share with you today. Um, we'll get into it. Uh, but when I talk, anytime I do my talks or talk about myself or talk about what I've gone through, um, I always have to start off with community just to give you some context into the type of person that I am. Uh, Community was everything to me. It's always been something that's really been critical in my life and pivotal in my development. Um, I grew up myself in a low-income community uh, with limited resources just because of my family situation. So growing up in this situation, I saw the world a little differently because I experienced it differently. And that being said, when I was navigating through life, I would always, and I was always taught to kind of look at my community, look at the larger picture, look at the people around me, um, and also look at some of the inequalities and social injustices that exist and persist. So that was kind of something that was always a part of me. That being said, um, I was able to really get involved in my community in various ways. Um, I was kind of I just grew up with this proactive sense of, okay, well, this is the issue, how do we solve it? Um, so I was really involved in youth councils on a local level, and through that I got a wonderful opportunity, uh, wonderful opportunities to travel abroad. So I was able to go to several different countries, um, uh, Uganda, Ghana, Tanzania, Jamaica, so many countries to do a lot of international work. So what does that have to do with the science conference? I'm getting there. Um, so science, what? Uh, while all of this social justice, community advocacy work was going on in my life, there was kind of this background uh, soundtrack also playing, uh, this love for science. I was always naturally curious. I always loved science. Um, growing up, I loved building things. I loved solving puzzles. Um, I loved watching anything that had to do with science, reading anything to do with science. It was just part of what made me tick. Now, I put science with a question mark because although I had a passion for it and I loved it, I didn't actually see myself as a scientist or see myself being part of science. In fact, every single time when I would think about, uh, when anyone would ask me, oh, you know, so it looks like you're getting into that science area. Do you think you're going to pursue that? I'd be like, no, no, no. Calm down. I'm just, you know, exploring, just uh, loving to see how things work. Uh, but this is not my career. This is not something that I want to do. And it was mainly because I just didn't feel like I would fit into the science world. It was really uh, the way that things, uh, the way that I perceived science and the way that I perceived the way scientists should be had nothing to do with me, and it had nothing to do with any of the people that I grew up with or was used to being around. So it was kind of foreign to me. Also, I think because of this negative perception that I had around science, I wasn't really keen on exploring the different careers. And some of the different careers that I did see, I still didn't really see myself there, and I still didn't really see um, a future for myself. So there were many barriers, and then other barriers uh, in terms of opportunity. Despite this, I still really felt like I should try and see what science is all about and how to get more involved. And this curiosity started leading into something more focused when I started getting more directed opportunities. One opportunity I got in high school was uh, just taking a normal biotechnology class. It was something different than anything I'd ever experienced up to that point. And at my high school in particular, we actually got to do hands-on biotech. So biotech labs, I think we, one of our labs was uh, identifying a bacterial strain. And I killed it. 
and I was also really good at it, and I loved it, and I was like, oh my goodness, this is what real science is like. And、uh, in talking to my biology teacher, he was telling me all these different careers. He's like, you know what I mean? You really have a thing for this. And I'm like, I do, I do. Thank you.、Uh, so it was. I was starting to feel very confident and starting to kind of own it. Something that was really foreign to me. I was starting to be like, well, this this kind of looks good. This lab coat looks good on you. Like you could do this.、Um, but all of that being said, there were still some barriers that would keep me away. I do remember I went to. I had never decided that I wanted to take science. Um, but then I took this grade ten bio- biotechnology class, so I went back to my guidance counselor and I said, you know what? I'm going to take chemistry. I'm going to take physics. My science grade was amongst the highest. Let's let's make this happen. And unfortunately, my guidance counselor told me, you know what? I think that'd be too hard for you. Maybe you should do these other courses. And that was really discouraging. But then I went back home to my African mother that was like, what? You're going to take those courses. <laughs> so. I did <laughs> through a series of events. I ended up taking those courses, and I ended up pursuing、uh, chemistry, biology, and physics in high school, and excelling and doing super well. And through that, I also got the opportunity、um, to take a, cor- a course at University of Toronto called the Summer Mentorship Course, where、um, it's ma- it was primarily targeted to、um, Black and Indigenous students, really engaging them、uh, in all things medicine. So going through that experience really helped me hone in on what I wanted to do, but also. Helped me to understand that yes, I'm going to take this in university. I'm going to pursue this. This is going to be great. This is going to be awesome. Great. And I, as I was navigating through high school into university, there was an age-old question that I'm sure many of you have heard. Many of you are asking, "What are you doing with your life? What are what am I doing?" So as I said, you know, I I loved the way the lab coat looked on me. I felt like yes, this is where I live,、um, but I there was so much uncertainty around that still. Even、uh, I did the summer mentorship program and I completed it, and it was targeted towards medicine. And I went into the I went into university and undergrad thinking that I wanted to do medicine, but then through volunteering at the hospital and through different things, I realized、mm, maybe patient care isn't something for me. What are you doing with your life? What are you, so I'm starting to get more confused. I'm starting to be like, okay, well, I'm in this science program. What am I going to do? I need to decide my whole life right now. I calmed down and I started to think, and I just continued to go on the path that I was on. I just continued to stay with the research that I was doing and be open to whatever courses, whatever things that I wanted to learn. I started taking more advanced chemistry courses because. I was really interested in chemistry, and that was something that I had previously shut off for myself. But I was like, "Oh, I'm doing well. Okay, let's keep going. Organic chemistry is hard for a lot of people, but it's coming for me, so I'm going to continue." So I started taking organic chemistry, started taking more advanced courses, and things started becoming a little more clear. Through a series of wild events. I decided to pursue my PhD in chemistry at the University of Toronto, and through that, as、uh, you've heard, I was able to work in a really exciting lab around、uh, developing cancer therapeutics, disease diagnostics, and、uh, different therapeutics designed、uh, in Alzheimer's research. Amazing experience! It was wonderful. I did that for four and a half years of my life, and not only as a PhD did I get to do groundbreaking research, but in particular in my lab, I had a lot of opportunities to mentor other students, supervise students, run projects. I just felt like a mini boss, and it was pretty dope. And the lab coat still looked good on me, as you can see. You know, <laughs> this is a very staged picture, so it's okay. But Throughout my PhD and even coming out of it, this question was still plaguing me: What are you doing with your life? I still didn't know. And if you could believe it, you just got your PhD. Isn't that isn't the path clear? I think a common myth is that. Your path is clear; that you know everything just because you're studying something. And I know because I had fellow PhD students who are also navigating this. We were still trying to figure out what are you going to do after this? What is that one career that you're going to step into that you're going to be passionate about that you're going to be able to excel in? So this was still a question that was haunting me and plaguing me throughout my whole PhD. Then 
I started to remember my roots. I started to remember what I really cared about, and I was still very much involved in my community throughout my undergrad and my PhD. For a long time, I felt like, well, these two worlds are just going to have to be separate, and I'm just going to have to pick one. I'm just going to have to pick one, and that's it. And I started to realize that I, I was putting science in a box, and I was putting scientists in a box. Even in speaking with the people that I met throughout my PhD, scientists cared about social justice issues. They cared about the world around them. In fact. The way that I was solving problems in the lab was applicable to the way that we can solve problems all over the world. So when I was developing these skills, I realized that are these things that separate? Do they have to be completely separated from each other? And I came to a conclusion that they didn't have to be. And I started really proactively looking at ways that my passion for community development could be coupled with my passion for science engagement. And then visions of science came into my life, and this organization I have the pleasure of running with a team of dedicated, extremely talented staff and volunteers from across the city. We work with youth in low-income communities to get them engaged in science, technology, engineering, and math. And we do that from a young age. We work to inspire, elevate, and empower. That's kind of our tagline.、Uh, them through different programs and. I was. It's what's really cool is that everything that I learned about community development and developing programs for youth in Toronto community housing, I was able to apply that design and that practice to building the different programs in this organization and really bringing community-based solutions to some of the critical problems that I was seeing, and also bringing STEM engagement to the community because, as I said. Me growing up, I didn't have any role models. I didn't even know a scientist personally, which might be different for some of you in this room. But that was a huge barrier for me to understand what a scientist was, what a scientist could be, and what a scientist could look like. So it was important. So that's what we're trying to do in communities right now. That being said, I know that this is. I know that you all have burning questions, and I want to just give you some advice on some things that I would love to. Would have loved to have heard when I was your age, so hopefully this will be helpful to you. One piece of advice throughout my journey: find your people. When I was、uh, doing、uh, my summer mentorship program, I think one of the most valuable、uh, outcomes of that program was not only what I learned, was the people that I met,、um, the women that I met. Throughout that program are actually my lifelong friends, my best friends, and、um, having people in your circle, especially in STEM, who share your passion, they help you when the hard times come and when it's really hard to solve difficult problems. So I would encourage you to find your people. Some of your people are in this room, and some of the people in this room you don't know yet. Be friendly, be open, but find your people. My next piece of advice would be try absolutely everything. I had experiences that were wonderful to get me engaged in STEM, and some weren't so great. Some weren't so great because at the end of the experience, I realized I actually really hate that. I don't ever want to do that again. That is valuable. Knowing what you don't like is actually valuable. Even in the process of trying to figure out what you like or what you're interested in, it was those moments where I was like, "Ooh, I actually hate being here." That helped me to understand that you know what, this isn't the place for me. There's another place for me. And in other ways, I started to really uh, uh, try and understand. Okay, I don't like being here, but why? And starting to think critically about myself, what I'm passionate about, what I like. You start to realize certain things about yourself, but try everything. Be open to everything. My third thing, as our friend Rihanna would say, work, 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 work. Like you are going to have to work, work, work a lot. And I say this because I know that I was there in undergrad when I was crying, studying, whatever I needed to do to get through. I encourage you to push through, but this will take work. I don't want to put this lightly. You can do it, 
but you're going to have to apply yourself to do it. And I don't doubt that anybody in this room can. I'm just letting you know that this is what you need to know. There's work ahead of you, but once you, put your, once you are passionate about it and you, put, you apply yourself, you'll be able to do it. And if the song helps you with just the momentum, you can have that in your head too. Develop your passion. And I don't say find your passion because as I said with some of my stories, um, you kind of, at this age, some, there are certain aspects of what you're passionate about that you already know. Develop it. I don't know what that looks like. That might be research. That might be figuring out the uncharted territory uh, that you need to walk into. Whatever that looks like, develop it. Don't be afraid to. Don't be afraid to explore different opportunities and different aspects of your passions. But develop it. And lastly, re. Present. That's why I spaced it out that way. Represent. Um, you will be the future role models that other people uh, that are looking up to you need. So don't hide uh, behind anything. Uh, make sure that you get yourself out there, put yourself out there, and share your stories. Um, I know that myself, I'm actually quite introverted, and I don't like talking about myself. I don't like talking about my story. I'd much rather just be chilling, doing my own thing. But what I started to realize when I started to share my story is that other people actually needed to hear it, that I had something important to say, and that I represented as a role model, not only for the people in my community, but people who might not even relate to me directly. You never know who needs to hear what you've gone through. Represent. You guys are all women. We're all women here. And we uh, are trying to advance a field and change the numbers of a field. In that, represent. You're here, and you're going to kill it. So do it well. I'll say this. I've pivoted. I've introduced myself as a scientist, and I will always be a scientist. But as a CEO, and I think Many of you uh, won't understand this, but we'll get to understand this. Is as a CEO, I'm able to do so many different things while being a scientist. So I'm able to be an advocate, a visionary, a strategist, a fundraiser, a mentor, a supervisor. And these were all things that I was able to do as a scientist. It's just the, the title has changed slightly. That being said, you be going as being a scientist, being an engineer, whatever whatever it is you want, whatever hat you wear, you can be many things. And all of the things that, you, all of the components of yourself, you bring to the table. So I would encourage you to bring to that to the table and bring that strong. And being an overall boss is nice too. <laughs> I'll end my talk with this, and I end many of my talks with this. Um, it's just a quote that I love. It's by a woman in tech, um, but I, I feel like it's my mantra, and it's, the reason why I do what I do. Um, numerous societal problems are waiting to be solved, and I realize more and more that we need untapped and underestimated minds to be among those creating the solutions. Um, I wouldn't be here unless people really gave me the opportunity to. So uh, I would encourage you to take your opportunity, seize it, and use it, and don't forget about the people around you as you move forward and do whatever you need to do as you take over the world. Uh, let's keep in touch. Thank you so much uh, for listening to me and listening to my story. And uh, yeah, thank you. <laughs> thank you so much, Eugenia. If you could stay, maybe just to answer a few questions, that would be great. It's embarrassing. Um, okay. Yeah, we've already got a nice good line here. Yes, okay. please go ahead. Hi. Hi, my name is Kate Vautour, and I'm from St. Mary's in Kitchener. Nice. Um, from your story, I heard you talk a lot about community, and then I also got the sense of um, your confidence and independence. Um, and I was wondering how both community and your independence both um, helped and hindered your career in STEM. Good, to, good question. I think um, when you are looking and trying to be a part of many different things and interact with many different people, you also need to take time to be really introspective and figure out what you want. Um, so with, with all of my community work and with uh, even seeing things, I always made sure that I took time, deliberate time, uh, to actually think about what are you feeling, Eugenia? Where do you want to be? What do you want to be doing? And what do you actually think about this issue? Where are you actually at? So um, 
The hindrances sometimes would be to just go with the flow, a lot of group think,、uh, but I think being able to pull back and really think about where I'm at and what I feel and where my moral compass is、uh, really helped me kind of shape the way that I viewed things. I hope that answered your question. <laughs> Hi, my name is Malen. I'm with St. John's College from Brantford.、Nice. So I also plan to pursue post-secondary at U of T. So、nice. that's kind of relatable.、Yeah. Um, I just wanted to say that your talk was very inspiring personally for me, and I'll definitely take away some of the things that you said and talked about today. I have a couple questions, so sorry if this is lengthy.、Oh. But、um, as an ethnic woman pursuing STEM who is highly accoladed, I'm sure you faced and still face stereotypes that coincide with such a position. How did you break through the stereotype barrier that was placed onto you? And if you could remember a specific situation,、um, would you mind sharing? <laughs> That's so funny.、Um, <laughs> uh, it's just funny because I know, like, there's one situation that happened many times when I was in the lab, and it was really funny.、Um, so everyone in our lab would wear these blue lab coats. That's just what the thing was. In the picture, I showed a white one, but it was literally just for the photo. We usually wear blue ones, and、um, I actually. Uh, as a senior grad student, I ran my half of the lab physically, and so whenever salespeople would come or anybody would come、uh, that didn't know us, they would come. I'd answer the door, and they'd be like, "Can we? I just need to speak to somebody who works here." I'm like, "Yep, yep, that's me with the lab coat. I'm the one that works here." And they'd be like, "Oh, oh sorry, I didn't realize. I didn't know what that was."、Um, but yeah, there were many, many times where,、uh, even at conferences,、uh, not being Recognized as a speaker, if I was the speaker,、um, or thinking that I wasn't going to be the person showing up when I did show up, that's happened. But Google would have helped them for that.、Um, <laughs> for me,、um, I've had to have a certain level of self-awareness and self-confidence to know that not everyone will understand where you're at, and not everyone will.、Um, Necessarily welcome you with open arms or expect you to be here, but you are here. You deserve to be here, and just claim your place when you have it. And that's kind of the confidence that I walk into spaces where I'm highly underrepresented. I just walk in well, like I deserve to be here, so I'll be here. And that's what it is. <laughs> <laughs> that's what it is. Thank you. I'm Christine Hoskin from Georgetown District High School, and I wanted to ask you: How do you maintain like your determination to pursue、uh, chemistry、mm-hmm. and even a PhD, even with all the barriers you faced? Yeah,、um, <laughs> I had a lot of support.、Um, I will not.、Uh, I don't know what the word is. I'm not going to undermine. That pressure and what that did. I actually many times would go back to, you know, my community center mentors or my mom and be like, you know what, I don't want to do this anymore. Like, just I, I want to do something else. And there was a lot of encouragement to say, you know what, no, you deserve to be here. That's imposter syndrome that you're feeling. Okay,、um, you deserve to be here. You work hard. You're smart. Just really、uh, focused encouragement、uh, to make sure that. What I what was getting in my head wouldn't actually get in my heart and hinder me from moving forward.、Um, I also had really amazing profs that I was honest with,、uh, especially some of the barriers that I was facing. I would talk to some of my profs, and honestly, we had really good relationships. Where I was like, you know, this is what I'm feeling, and they're like, no, but your marks show this, so you're great. Just calm down.、Um, so yeah, it was a lot of conversation, and I had a good community around me, so it was good. Thank you. Thank you. I think, unfortunately, we'll have to make this our last、oh, question. So,、okay. sorry. sorry, guys. Kinda... Um, my name is Naomi, and also very inspired by your story, and it really resonates with me. And I'm very proud of you. Thank you.、Um, and my question is just:、um, Have you ever, like, is there a particular moment that you can recount where you experienced failure, and how did you find the strength to, like, overcome and find resilience? Oh wow! <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I did.、Um, during my PhD, we had these like a lot of comprehensive exams, and I know one of mine did not go well. I studied; everything was great,、um, and at the last minute, I was talking to my supervisor, and we decided to make one change to my slides, and 
in my heart, I was like, tell him that we shouldn't make this change because it might open a can of worms that you're not ready to deal with. I'm like, nah, I got this. That one change resulted in like an hour of questioning from the people on my comp committee, and that hour of questioning just turned into something really bad. <laughs> um, and it was really bad. Uh, from the level that I was at academically and even in my lab and even the awards that I had gotten, not doing well on that comp just made me look like, do you even deserve anything? Like, who are you? Uh, so that was hard, and it was really tough for me. Um, I had to pray a lot. I had to talk to my parents. I had to really uh, remember why I was there. Uh, I journal a lot. That might be like a weird quirk, but I have to journal a lot. So I had to really go back to why are you here in the first place? What's motivating you? Um, and kind of be super introspective. But then also, I was back in the lab the next day, figuring out what to do to make what happen better. And I was studying, and I was doing what I needed to do. And I'm like, OK, you cry for 2.5 seconds, and then you just go get this. <laughs> so it was one of those things where it was like, I did cry. And trust and believe, I was talking to my lab mates. I'm like, this is super embarrassing, but we're just going to do what we need to do. And we're going to move forward. And it was that resilience. I had to play it off. I was hurt, I was hurt but I was going to get my PhD regardless. So I'm like, well, just going to have to get up and keep going. So, yeah, sometimes that's what it's like. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> so thank you so much. Thank Maria. you. <laughs> so we're now going to move on to our panel discussion. Um, I'm going to invite our panelists to come up and uh, take a seat here on the stage with me. This is a great opportunity if, while we're just setting up here, if you're feeling a little cramped, take a moment, stand up, stretch a little bit, Get your wiggles out if you need to. Um, and then once everyone's here on stage, we'll get started. You guys would like to come up? everyone if I could are they gonna turn me back okay we'll wait okay okay everyone yeah we're good I'm still waiting for my mic now but Okay, in this, so in our panel session today, we're going to get a chance to dive a little bit deeper into some of these STEM career paths, and we're going to have lots of opportunity for questions. Um, our panelists are going to share uh, how they got to where they are today, tell us a little bit about their education and some of the choices that they made. Uh, we're fortunate to have four amazing panelists with diverse backgrounds. Um, they're all at different stages of their career. Um, you can find them listed in your program. Um, so I'd like to introduce Emily Levesque. She's an assistant professor of astronomy at the University of Washington. And we've got Janan Abdurrahman, a process control engineer at Lakeside Process Controls. And she's also a senior instructor at Zebra Robotics. 
Um, Monica Torres, uh, she's a general surgeon at Grand River Hospital and St. Mary's General Hospital, and also Jesse Pop, wildlife specialist at the Anishinaabek Ontario Fisheries Resource Centre and adjunct professor at Laurentian University. So welcome to all of our panellists, and thank you for taking a time, the time to join us today. To start this, the, the panel discussion, I'm just going to have uh, each panelist briefly introduce themselves and say a little bit about themselves. During that time, you can certainly make your way to the microphone so we can be ready to jump into questions right after. Emily, let's start with you. All right, hi everybody, and I'm, I'm now breaking a three-person chemist streak. <laughs> I am an astronomer, and I was interested in this career from a really young age. I got into astronomy, I think, when I was about two years old, and my family did some stargazing in my backyard. Growing up, I stayed incredibly interested in science. I had a mix of other interests as well. I was really into music and theater, and I really liked writing. So deciding to go into science, I remember worrying that I was going to lose some of those areas that I was really interested in. And it's actually been amazing to me how much those interests in the arts have helped me as a scientist and have been things I've been able to still pursue. So I decided to go into science. I did an undergraduate degree at MIT. And then I went to graduate school at the University of Hawaii. Um, and there I got my PhD in astronomy. After that, I worked at the University of Colorado for five years as a postdoctoral researcher. And now I'm about two and a half years into working as a professor. It's a really interesting job. I get to do research. I get to teach. I really get to do a mix of things. And I'm thoroughly enjoying being a scientist. And I'm really glad that I made that decision years ago. Awesome. Thanks, Emily. Janan? Awesome. So uh, my name is Janan, and I always thought that I was going to be a lawyer. Didn't turn out to be like that. I currently work as a process control engineer, which I like to explain as when you have companies that make a certain product, for example, um, if you wanted to make Coke, you'd need a whole bunch of products, and there would be some tanks and some valves and some pumps. And all of those things need to work together in order to make coke. So you would need to check the levels in the tanks. You would need to open the valves. And I code all of that so that it can kind of work together. And so people who are operating that plant know what's going on and make sure that they're actually making coke and not something completely disgusting. <laughs> and um, I also teach robotics to younger kids. I currently teach students between the ages of 6 and like 10. And we do very simple coding and robotics. And I really just like them because they're so cute. Um, so that's one of the reasons that I'm doing that. Um, I graduated from Ryerson University in avionics. So I really studied aerospace engineering. But I found that it was very, very specific. And I went into it on recommendation of, of some of my teachers. And I don't think that I researched the industry enough. Um, so I wanted to do something a little bit more general after school. And that's why I ended up doing process control. Monica? So um, my name is Monica Torres. I'm a surgeon at Grand River Hospital. Um, so basically, if you probably might get appendicitis, there's a big chance that I'll be seeing you at the hospital. I hope you don't get it. Um, but that's me. Um, I was born in Colombia, um, so South America. And then I immigrated to Canada about 15 years ago. Um, I did medicine in Colombia, did general surgery in Colombia and then decided to get out of the country for whatever reasons, violence and all those things. And um, opportunities came in Canada. It was, um, I made the right people at the right time, but I had to redo everything again. So all the training that I did in Columbia was, didn't mean anything. And I had to come here and do my five years of general surgery again. So that was hard, um, but it's got me to where I am. And then the other thing that happened was that I had to work in another service area for five years because I was in international medical graduate. So I ended up in Goderich uh, for five years. It's a town of 8,000 people. And um, I realized that, well, I liked it and it's beautiful, but I'm not a small town person. And then I got a job here in, in Grand River Hospital about a year ago. Um, very happy to be here. It's been a long journey. It's not been easy. And, um, but it's definitely just keep your goals where you want to go and keep working on it and never stop. Okay. 
Hi, um, so I'm a wildlife ecologist and I've pretty much known uh, since I was a kid what I wanted to do. Um, my, my mother used to take me out and in the forest all the time and she would be collecting plants and I, I grew this really deep appreciation for, for the natural environment, for wildlife. Um, it wasn't until I was a, a little bit older but still a kid that I learned about what extinction was and that species across the world were, um, were becoming at risk or threatened um, with extinction. And that, you know, that really um, made me concerned because this world I was so in love with was now in jeopardy. So I knew from a young age that I, I wanted to devote my life um, to, to not only helping with conservation, but to ensuring that animals didn't get to that point where they were threatened. Um, so ensuring sustainable wildlife populations, that populations weren't declining through time. So I went on and I, I did a Bachelor of Science, Master of Science and PhD, which was great. Um, quite a few years of school, but, but really fun. Um, as, as I got up to the um, graduate levels, I got to do like everything I wanted to do. Um, I work in large mammals, which is which is something that I really like to do. Um, so I've worked with, with um, species like black bears and wolves and um, elk, moose, white-tailed deer, boreal caribou, but I also dabbled in um, with other species as well. So I've worked on uh, howler monkeys in Nicaragua. I did some, some fisheries work, some um, entomology, so insects. So really great. I got to do a lot of field work, which is important to me because I love being out in the natural environment. So a lot of um, um, ATVing and hiking and canoeing. Um, I did um, animal trapping, uh, telemetry. Also did a lot of flying. So we did. Uh, I've done a lot of wildlife surveys through um, helicopter and, and fixed wing. So really great. One thing uh, I noticed though when I was going through um, school was that um, indigenous uh, perspectives, indigenous knowledge weren't really um, incorporated in in the science courses that I was in in the program. So I kind of made that. It, like it wasn't until I, I did some learning myself that I even found out what traditional ecological knowledge was and that's essentially knowledge that indigenous people have about the environment that's passed down through generations and that's that's really important knowledge and when when you combine that with western science you can really advance modern science so I, I made that um, part of my uh, career to to bring that uh, awareness how important that was so I integrate it now in my research uh, with the um, Anishinaabe Ontario Fisheries Resource Centre, I, I help First Nation communities in Ontario with wildlife monitoring and research projects and always integrating um, Indigenous knowledge, Indigenous perspectives with, with Western science approaches. Um, and at, the, at Laurentian University, I, I, I um, supervise graduate students working on those, those programs and teach courses in that area. So um, it's, been a, it's been a great um, uh, time in my, uh, in my career and I I'm just love what I do and I'm I have lots of fun doing it. Thanks so much. Okay, well, we're going to take your questions now. Uh, so please uh, make your way to the mic, but maybe just to get things started, I was chatting with, so please, guys. Um, so I was chatting with uh, some of you guys this morning, and I noticed a lot of you were saying things like, I have to figure out what I'm going to do, um, and I have no idea what I'm going to do, and how do I know, or these kinds of things. And was there a moment, it sounds like you, Jesse, you knew from a young age what you wanted to do, but was there a moment for you guys where you were like, I know exactly what I want to do, and I'm going to just go get it, or was it kind of more incremental along the way? Um, I know in my case, I knew really early on that I really loved astronomy, but I loved a lot of things. I think everybody, I know most of our audience is in high school, and you do so many different things in high school, and there's a lot of activities that you enjoy. And I remember debating near the end of high school studying astronomy or actually studying music. I was a very serious violinist and was considering doing that instead. And I think what ultimately made my mind up was I thought about, one, it seemed easier to do violin as a hobby than to do astrophysics as a hobby. <laughs> and I realized that if I went into that career and watched astronomy go on and saw people making these exciting discoveries, I'd be a little sad that I wasn't a part of it. So it sort of turned into what of the things I love would, he, would I most miss if I wasn't able to do it. And that was what ultimately kicked off the decision for me. Awesome. Yeah, and did you have any? Um, when I was in high school, the reason that I decided to go into engineering was because I had a teacher and it's, he was very inspiring to me because he was actually trained as an engineer in university and then he did teacher's college afterwards and became a physics teacher, but he was also a professional chocolatier and chef and he would compete and make these amazing chocolate sculptures and take them to like world competitions and 
it was crazy to me that he had so many different things that he was passionate about, but also kind of incorporated into his career strategy and into his career path. And so when I spoke to him about like, I was like, I'm sure of it, I love physics now, and I'm just gonna do everything physics, I'm gonna be a physics teacher, and he's like, you know, why don't you learn engineering, why don't you see what else is out there? And um, so his ability to kind of have, I don't wanna say different career paths, but kind of dabble in different things that were completely um, separate from one another, really made it comfortable for me to do that. And so when I did engineering, I had the intention of going to teacher's college after. But then when I started teaching robotics, I realized that this was kind of a good mix of both. And I could still kind of be hands-on with teaching robotics. And that was part of the thing that I liked about engineering was it was very hands-on. So that helped me kind of in that sense. Awesome, thanks. I see we've already got a great queue, so maybe we'll switch over to your guys' questions. Yeah? Uh, hi, my name is Ima Kagoma. I go to St. John's College, and this question's mostly for Pop and Levesque, but how did you really delve into and explore like those non-traditional STEM careers otherwise than, say, engineering or medicine that people generally think? Um, so I, I really liked astronomy from the get-go. I remember reading a book when I was a little kid about um, it was a children's book about a kid who had a toy transformer that could transform into a spaceship and fly him around the solar system. So from early on, I knew that's what I was interested in. And I had relatives who knew that I was interested in science and were asking me, well, do you want to be an engineer? Do you want to be a doctor? And I think their questions were coming from a really reasonable perspective, especially for anybody that sort of came from a middle class or working class family of astronomy seems neat, but are there jobs? And maybe if you study engineering or medicine, something with a really clear career path, that'll be better. And I was mostly stubborn because I knew that that was what I loved. I said, engineering is fascinating. My brother's an engineer. I have uncles who are engineers, but I really want to do astronomy. So it came from really getting sucked into that specific field that kind of captured my imagination. Jesse, did you? Yeah. So, um, I, so like I said, I've always wanted to do wildlife ecology. Um, and actually, when I was in high school, I, I really wanted to share that with, with my teachers and say, like, tell me what to do. How do I go pursue this dream? And just share it with how excited I was. And I remember um, in, in upper year, grade 11, um, I talked to one of my teachers, a math teacher, and, and just said, you know, I want to do biology and help me out. And he, he looked at me and said, you know, if I were you, I, I probably wouldn't pursue biology. There's, there's really no jobs. There's not great money. And I was like, oh. <laughs> and I was, you know, kind of stunned. And I thought, well, geez, I'm not going to pursue biology if I'm, if I'm never going to get a job. So I didn't. So actually what I first did was um, go to college. I went to college to become a veterinary technician, which was still animals, so still cool, very interesting. Um, I did a year of that, and I said, you know what, th this is interesting, but this is not what I want. This is not, this is not what I live for. This is not what I'm meant to do. So I said, you know what, no, I'm going to, I'm going to, I got to try. I, got, I can't live my life and say I've never tried to become a biologist. So I tried. I went to university and, and here I am. I'm, I'm a biologist. And what I want to say to you guys is, um, like Linda was saying, there's, there's quite a few things that you have to take into consideration when you're deciding on the direction that you want to go. Um, are there jobs? Are there not? But or, or money, or, or, and that can influence your decision. Um, but those decisions aren't meant to, um, you know, prevent you from, from uh, following your dream. They're meant to prepare you. If you're going into a field that doesn't have many jobs, you just makes yourself aware that you have to work harder. There's not very many jobs, but there are some, and someone gets those jobs, right? So if you're dedicated enough, if you work hard enough, um, you will become what you want to be. Th that's what happened with me. Thank you. Um, my name's Carly. I'm from KCI. And I was just wondering, in following this path, did you have any regrets about following this path or like opportunities you didn't take? Thanks. Monica, maybe we'll start with you. <laughs> it's uh, funny you asked that question because I was talking about it last night. Um, there was one, when I was uh, growing up in Colombia, um, the last year of my medical school, we could go outside and uh, to North America or Canada and do a rotation there. So I decided to go to Harvard Medical School and uh, stay there for a month and did laparoscopic surgery. And, um, and I loved it and it was amazing, but I wanted to go back to Colombia. And I remember that one day um, 
this doctor said, well, why don't we go and have lunch? I said, yeah, sure, I'll have lunch. And uh, he said, well, I think you're very smart. Um, I want to help you get into North America, go do your exams, and um, just, and I said, no, you know what, I want to go back to Colombia. I want to be a doctor in Colombia. I want to work for my country. And, um, and then I went back to my country. So now I think, well, what would have happened if I had said yes to that question um, so many years ago? So yes, yeah, so some opportunities you do let go. You regret? No, because I'm here now. Um, but I do wonder what would have happened if I had said yes at that time. Anybody else feel like they want to comment on that? Or? No? OK, you can move on. So, uh, hi, my name is Jessica Guerrero. I'm from Assumption College in Brantford. And science sometimes seems like it's its own secluded little world. It feels like it's in a box. It's sort of unreachable. But it's obviously very important to society. A lot of advancement comes from science. So I'm wondering, and I'm sort of directing this more towards Emily, since I'm a future physics and astronomy student, and astronomy is one of my passions. <laughs> how do you feel that your field of science contributes to the world, and how do you think it can help society in the future? I love this question when it comes to astronomy, because it does not, at face value, look like a very practical Field. So my research specialty is how really massive stars evolve and explode as supernovae and die. And there isn't necessarily an immediate technological advance that's going to happen tomorrow if we understand how a star evolves. But one, we never have a roadmap for discovery, so it's really hard to say if something we're studying and just starting to understand at really like the forefront of physics now might be practical later. I also like thinking of astronomy in particular as a gateway science. It's a science that everybody has been curious about. If you've ever looked up at the sky, you've gotten some sort of question about astronomy. And photos from Hubble or other telescopes are on the cover of the New York Times, on the cover of Discover Magazine. So it's a great science for capturing people's curiosity. And it works great with little kids. When I give public talks, I'll get a line of eight-year-olds who all want to know everything about black holes. And I don't necessarily think that all of those eight-year-olds are going to become astronomers, but they've all had their curiosity piqued about science. So maybe then when they go back to school, they think, well, math class is going to help me do science. Or I'll pay attention in my science class and maybe discover another passion. So I think it's helpful as a way of funneling people into other fields that they might eventually find a serious passion in. Thank you. And thanks. Hi, I'm Julia, and I go to St. John de Brebeuf High School in Vaughan. And I have a question for Monica. I was wondering, um, what advice do you give for young women who want to pursue a career in the medical field? You have to study hard. It's a long process. It's a never-ending process um, because you are always studying. And people say, well, it's going to take you many years to finish. Well, it's going to take you your whole life to finish. Um, I just finished a course um, a year ago about quality and safety in healthcare. So. Even now, I'm still studying, so just think that you're going to always study. It's going to be hard. You're going to have some uh, difficult moments around the, along the way, but, uh, but if you really want to get there, just put it in your mind. And it might take you 20 years, but uh, it took me 20 years to get here, so just work on it. Thank you. Hi, my name is Bianca Laube, and I'm from KCI. And I was wondering if there was any point in your career where you thought you weren't good enough for what you wanted to pursue, even though you loved it. Did you worry that you weren't good enough to actually like become successful? Anybody want to go with that one first? Um, I can start, I guess. Um, I'm not sure. You always have moments where you're you're not sure, or I can't say you always, but I've had moments in my career where I wasn't sure if um, I knew enough. And sometimes when you go out of, when you just graduate from school and you feel like you've learned a lot of theory and you feel like you're ready because you've spent four years or if you've done um, degrees after that, then even longer, and you get out into the field and you're ready to start working and you're ready to start doing what you've been trained to do. And then, you start and you go maybe meet with some customers or meet with some new people or have a, your manager or your boss come and talk to you about things and you're listening to them and sometimes you don't always understand 100% of what they're saying or um, you'll get started on the project and you're not, you're not completely certain if you're, if you're ready for that and then comes that little bit of doubt, I guess, where you're like, oh, maybe I, I don't know enough or maybe I need to study some more. Like, I guess I'm done school now, but 
I think like Monica said, like learning is never done and you continuously learn as you're working. And I think it's that when you feel that, just having some confidence to know that you're still starting out, you need to ask questions, you need to try and learn more um, through the people that you're around, but also have confidence in what you do know. Um, and also, sometimes I think when you feel like that, you also let what people say to you kind of get to you a little bit. When I first went to site, um, I had my hard hat and like my steel toes and I'd never worn steel toes before. So I was like, oh, okay, let's do this. And I went to site with my hard hat and the site manager was like, like, could you even put that on like over your scarf? And I was like, I don't know, I never tried it before, but, <laughs> but I'm gonna try it now and I think it will be fine. And it was just like his, his lack of confidence in me and like my ability to, to be there um, kind of made me a little bit nervous, but then I kind of turned it around for myself and I was like, you have to now show him that you fit in here and like you will rock these steel toes. They're so ugly, but you will rock them. <laughs> and like you will wear this hard hat and have like a line on your forehead for the rest of the day, but it will be great. And you will show him that you can be here and like be the engineer that he really doesn't think that you are, you know? So I think it definitely, you definitely have moments of that, especially maybe when you're first starting out in your career because you're really not sure, but the more confidence you have, and I think like good support too, like sometimes I'll call my dad and I'll just be like so upset, and he'll say like, don't worry, you're fine, just do what you need to do, and you'll come home and you're gonna tell me that it's totally fine and you had the best day ever, but right now you're just freaking out because you're just starting out, so yeah. Anyone else? Yeah. So yeah, I would say that feeling is completely normal. Um, I think most people probably feel like that. I know I personally do quite a lot. And at first, you, you really get those feelings like, oh, I don't know if I can do this. This is so intimidating. Um, but you know, the more and more you, you prove yourself to yourself, like those, those kind of fears start slipping away and, and you gain more confidence. Like, yes, I can do this. But even still to this day, I'm going to be completely honest, when I was invited to, this, to attend this event, I was so excited because this is something I love to do. I hope that one of you in here will be inspired to maybe become a wildlife ecologist. Um, but, you know, and so I immediately accepted. But after that, I, I did some looking through um, who the women who would be attending here with me today and who have in the past. And I was like, oh my God, <laughs> I'm like so intimidated. Like these are, these are super women. These are amazing, incredible women. And, um, and yet, like I said, I was intimidated, but then I realized, you know what? I'm kind of a superwoman too. I've made my dreams come true in my own little way. I'm contributing to making the world a better place. And every one of you in the audience, you guys are all, you all have that inside you, that, that career superwoman. And, you know, it can come out and, and be confident and let yourself shine because, because you really can do anything. And I would like to say something else regarding that. It happens very frequently that other people don't think you can make it. Uh, it happened to me many, many times. And I would say I learned from each time that it happened. And then it made me think, okay, so you don't think I can do it, but I think I can do it. So how am I gonna prove to you that I can do it? So there are these options. And there's not only one option, because not only one thing works. So try one, try two, try three. And one of these is gonna work and it's gonna show the other person that you can do it. But you have to believe in yourself and just every time, and know that it's gonna happen, because it will happen. Great, thank you. Hi, my name is Kristen. I'm from St. Elizabeth Catholic High School in Vaughan. Um, I was wondering, maybe specifically as an engineer, if there are any specific um, extracurriculars or personal projects that you have done that you would encourage us as well to do. Um, so I think that one thing I really recommend for young girls to take part in, or if, if your school or if your community center have like robotics teams or competitions, not necessarily um, for the actual what you will build, but the skills that you learn there and the people that you meet a lot of times in high school if you have like a robotics team, you'll meet other, um, there are engineering mentors and stuff who will come in and you'll get to meet them and talk to them and get comfortable with them and hear their story. And I think that in high school that a lot of people told me to do this and I was so nervous, but it was like if you have a job that you have in mind and you kind of want to know what that person does, reach out to them and see what they do. But then whenever I'd like get 
the courage to go on LinkedIn and like search up like, oh, this person has this job, I want it, and like try and message them, I would just freeze up and be like, oh, they don't want to hear from me, like I'm 15, they, like they don't care. But I think when you have those mentors or when you do activities that kind of let those mentors naturally into your life and you can learn from them through that, then that is also just really helpful. And um, from the teams that I've seen, like high school robotics teams or like coding competitions and stuff like that, a lot of girls kind of shy away from it because they're typically male-dominated teams. But I find that the girls who go out for those are just so skilled and talented and they just don't realize because they've just been kind of nervous to join and do activities like that. So yeah, I think that would be my, my recommendation. As an instructor in robotics, do you have like any uh, tips on specific programs that you would recommend, or it's mostly depends on what school? Like I, that? <clears throat> sorry, um, I think that through school or through teachers, you can get a lot of good resources. But if you um, maybe want to start something on your own to see what you like, like maybe you like more of the electronic side of things, or maybe you like more of the building side, or maybe you're into coding and the um, that side of it, the back software side of it, then there are tons of resources that if you go into, even if you go into the Apple store, they have like a full wall of robots on the side where like you, they have one that's like a, like a sphere that you can learn coding on completely and you can do it all by yourself. They have like an app and they've made it completely front, like user friendly and it's really pretty with lots of colors and like you can code and it like fills in the rest of the code for you like autocorrect and it's great so um, it's, if you want to do something like that, like just going to places um, like the Apple Store or even Best Buy and trying out like simple robotics first is always a good step. But other than that, yeah, I think that's awesome. Yeah. Thanks. Hi, my name is Grace, and I had a question about like society in general. So a lot of times there's going to be conflicting desires and beliefs of different people with your own beliefs and also with money and all of that. So how do you reach a conclusion or a decision? Because your decision may not align with others. How do you reach the right decision? That's a good question. That's a big question. <laughs> I think. So is your question more geared to how do you... Um, how do you navigate people's different beliefs in your in your career? Um, does anybody? Want so, I I know that one version of this is when you're trying to say decide like what you're going to study in college or where you're going to go to college, and you'll be getting advice from your teachers and from your friends and from your parents, and. Sometimes the advice completely conflicts. So one person will say, do you think A? And another person will say, do you think B? And you're left going, OK. <laughs> um, the best way that I've found is to try and gather as broad a variety of advice and opinions as I possibly can, and then make the decision myself. And it's not a matter of getting advice and ignoring it, but it's a matter of gathering perspectives and then trying to synthesize those and think, well, what actually makes the most sense for me? Where do I actually think? the right decision lies here. And that actually goes a little bit into something that's come up of self-confidence and um, somebody else mentioned imposter syndrome during one of the talks. And that doesn't just involve you know, the confidence to say, I can do math. Sometimes it involves the confidence to say, I can make these decisions. And I can listen to people who may be older than me, who may have more life experience, but this is a decision that I can gather information on and decide for myself. So that's its own kind of confidence that winds up being really helpful as you try to sort of make these decisions based on sometimes very conflicting opinions. So I hope that helps answer your question. Anybody else have anything to add? No? OK. Thank you. Uh, hi, my name is Hannah from St. Mary's High School. And my question was more geared towards like, Dr. Torres. Um, Obviously, in your career, you would deal with, uh, like, as a surgeon, you would deal with kind of patient death and kind of uh, like a sad atmosphere. What, did that ever affect you and change like how you like maybe make you think that you wouldn't be able to handle it? So <clears throat> when you go through medicine, um, they teach you how to manage that because it's, it's very hard, um, but you have to learn how to deal with it. And that's part of what you learn during medical school and during residency is how to deal with that, how to understand it, how to help other people through that journey. Um, and, and you learn how to do that. And also just a quick question. Um, 
again with kind of struggles and challenges, uh, how did you find it when redo, kind of like redoing your training, being with people that were like a lot, uh, maybe younger than you and just starting out their career while you had all the, like the same experience? So it was, it was very, very hard um, to redo. You feel like you're redoing high school and that's the way I felt the first few years. And um, it was very difficult. Um, I asked for help to my teachers and um, the university had help. And um, at the end, I decided that I was gonna learn the best from what I was learning and learn from the people that were younger than me and learn as much as I could. Um, it wasn't easy at all. Um, and I would respect everybody and um, I don't know everything and it was a learning experience and medicine, medicine changes every, every day. So what I learned during my first residency, it's different than what I learned in my second residency and then I got to think, well, this is different. I'm gonna learn more and just respect everybody and you can learn from everybody, young or old. Um, so just know that you're gonna learn every day. Thank you. Hello, <laughs> sorry. Hello, my name is Sophia and I'm from WCI. And it's sort of like the previous question. So when you moved from Colombia and you had to go through all of the training, what helped you keep motivated? Like what made you keep thinking that I still wanna be a surgeon, a doctor, I don't wanna to switch to another profession because maybe it'll be easier to go that instead of going through all the training again? So at that point in my life, I knew I wanted to be a surgeon and I wouldn't change it for anything in the world. So, um, so that was my goal. And um, I thought, okay, what do I need to do in order to make this happen? And um, try to go through each one of those steps. So I learned everything that I had to do in order to make it happen. So what exams I needed to take, um, what people I needed to meet, and started knocking doors and um, talked with program directors and talked with everybody, asked as many questions as I could, talked with as much people as I could. Um, to learn what I needed to do in order to get there. And the main thing was, I'm not gonna stop until I'm there. And nothing's gonna stop me, uh, so I'll just keep going. And it took me seven years. But, um, but I just kept going and going and going and whatever challenge I had, I had to find a way to go and make things happen. Thank you, and I like your shoes, by the way. <laughs> Thank you. I'm Christine Hoskin from Georgetown District High School, and I know, especially as like a woman in STEM, there's going to be hiccups, uh, hiccups along the way in your career. So this is a question directed uh, to all of you on how you deal with those hiccups and when things don't go your way. How do you like any advice for picking yourself back up and kind of accepting failure and learning from it? Yeah. So I think there's going to be a lot of hiccups. Um, <laughs> it's it's a bumpy road through um, pursuing academia. Um, there's a lot of ups and downs, and there's a lot of perceived barriers. Um, people today were talking about barriers, and, and as we know, these are all perceived. So you, you can surpass them, you can get going through and, and continue on with what you want. Um, and just, just keep in mind, like, you know, there's, there's downs and there's ups. So you're going to make it through, but it's, it's okay to get stressed out, and it's okay to, you know, take a break and cry for 2.5 seconds um, as long as you get back up because you know th if that's what you want you got to make sure that you you get there one day and one thing that way is get someone that supports you um, it's important to have somebody to look that you can call when you're down and you know that they're gonna bring you back up thank you it's pretty much the same, exact yeah. like that. <laughs> I, I think the one thing I'd add is, um, you'd mentioned that there are downs, but there are also ups. And I think it's human nature for anybody and something that's sometimes especially easy for women to internalize to make a lot more of the downs than the ups. Um, I teach, and as part of my classes, I'll get teaching evaluations and I'll get 50 comments saying, this class was awesome, and one comment saying, I didn't like it, and I fixate on the one. <laughs> so when you're running into setbacks, it's very natural to be disappointed, to be upset, like you said, to cry for 2.5 seconds and then keep going. I think it's just as important when something goes your way to take the win and really celebrate it. And sometimes it's easy to say, oh, well, I just got that award because of so-and-so reason, or, oh, maybe this wasn't that big a deal, and it's really good to go, no, 
I got this because I'm awesome. <laughs> and that momentum sometimes helps carry you through the next time something goes poorly that you can look back and say, well, this was a setback, but things have also gone really well. So in aggregate, things are still fine. Thank you. Hi, my name's Amy. I'm from Saint, uh, <laughs> Sir John and McDonald Secondary School. Um, my question was, obviously going into the fields you went into, you probably had to make some sacrifices. And I was wondering what some of those sacrifices would be and if you regret taking any of those. I know, Martha, you mentioned maybe <laughs> you had one um, already. Um, so the other... I don't know if I regret it or not, but um, I made the decision not to have children um, and to make my career my life. I don't regret it, but it was a big decision. I, I think a big sacrifice, at least for me in academia, was um, time, um, time to go, you know, how, be able to do lots of other things I wanted to do. You have to work hard in, in some fields. You really, really do have to work hard um, and, and focus a lot of your time and energy into succeeding. Um, so, so yeah, I, I, I didn't get to do some of the other things I wanted to do, but what was important to me was the, the big picture was my dream, making my dream come true. And although I didn't get to have like a lot of free time through the process, I wake up every day and I can't wait to go to work. My entire day mm. is exciting to me. So you do, you do make some sacrifices on the way up, but once you get there, it's, it's so worth it. Thank you. Hi, my name's Catherine. Um, I'm also from SGM. And I was wondering what it was like to be an international student and if it was really worth it, like, for the opportunities, because I know in Canada, like in Ontario here, we have UW, UT, and Guelph, and all those great universities. Um, would it, do you think it would be worth, worth it if you went to like another country or international, as an international student? Because I know it's more expensive, but do you think it would be worth it? Yeah. Anybody that has, I mean, obviously from going from Colombia, <laughs> um, international experiences or thoughts on that? So I think that um, the more international experiences you can gather, the better. Because when you grow up in only one country, you kind of have one vision. But as soon as you leave the country, either for a more developed country or underdeveloped country, your vision grows. And um, like some of the previous speakers said about going to uh, Africa or South America, or even going to more um, going to states and going to big universities in the states to get more training that opens your mind so i would say get as many opportunities outside of the country as you can because you already have you already have your canadian structure so learn as many outside of canada that you can thank you Hi, I'm Trishti, and I'm from uh, Glenview Park in Cambridge, and my question's for all of you. I feel like now that I'm learning about a lot of different things, I'm finding that I'm passionate in a lot of different things, and, if I, feel, and I feel like if I go into um, a harder subject like medicine, I'll have to let go of my other passions, which I really don't want to do. Do you have any advice? Um, so I, I very much sympathize with being interested in a lot of things and having trouble picking, and one thing that I found really helpful was trying things. Um, I was lucky enough when I was in middle school and then in high school to do things like summer programs where I could take a class and I think I took like a paleontology class, an astronomy class, a biotech class, and they gave me the chance to immerse myself in things and help sort of narrow down what I thought I would be interested in. And as far as having to give up other interests, I mean, that definitely happened at some point. I started at MIT and declared myself a physics major. Somebody else was asking about um, times when you thought you maybe weren't good enough. I'd barely ever taken physics and then jumped into majoring in physics next to people who had literally taken quantum physics in high school. So I was just like, oh my God, for about <laughs> the first year. And I was trying to play violin at the same time. I had a violin scholarship and I was playing in the MIT orchestra. And I stopped after the first year because I was thinking, well, this is becoming a chore. I don't like it anymore. And I need every second to do 
the work that I'm doing. So I was sad to stop playing at the time, but I sort of kept it up in the background, and I actually now play again, and I play in the orchestra at the University of Washington. So it is true that sometimes you have to temporarily triage other things that you're doing or put them on, on, on the back burner to prioritize what your goal is, but to me that never felt too disappointing because it was in the service of what I knew I ultimately wanted to do. And you're able to sometimes bring them back. If you really do love something, then you can find an opportunity or you can find the time in your life, maybe not right away, but maybe down the road so that you can keep it up. Thank you. I think this will be our last question. Thank you. Um, I'm Sydney from Assumption College in Brantford. It's kind of a similar question, but almost the opposite. I've kind of decided I'd like to go into aerospace engineering, but I'm worried that I'm like narrowing my options and then I'll be like in the future, if I change my mind, I'll be stuck and I won't have anything to do. Do you have any recommendations? Um, I think that when you go in to aerospace, you kind of very quickly get a, a sense of whether or not you enjoy it enough um, career-wise. But the great thing is that it, it does take a lot of um, skills from the other engineering, like electrical and mechanical, and also um, a little bit of a computer. And so you do learn a lot of transferable skills, which is why I went into a more of an electrical chemical engineering discipline after I started working. And I think that I was very much worried about the same thing when I started because I was recommended to go into aerospace and I was like, oh, it sounds so cool. Like, I'm going to love it and it's going to be great and I'm going to work and it's going to be awesome. But then when I left school, I felt like I didn't learn enough about different things to know if I could be good at other, at other careers. And I hadn't really done a lot of research on what I could do after school with my degree. But then when I was applying for jobs, I started talking to other engineers, and they were like, you know, the, big, the biggest um, limitation that you're putting on yourself is you feel like you're only qualified for certain things. But you can continuously learn, and if you want to go into other industries, or if you want to go into a specific type of aircraft, or if you want to go into just like UAVs, for example, or even spacecraft, then you can also learn and tailor your knowledge to that specific thing. So I don't think, um, in any way that like having a degree in something more specialized has limited, will limit you or has limited me um, because now I don't really work in anything related to aerospace but all of the skills that I have I can very proudly say I got from my degree. Thank so you. I, sorry, I actually um, used to run a program at the University of Colorado for physics and astronomy majors talking about what they could do with their degrees. And astronomy sounds super narrow. Like, how can you possibly generalize that if you want to go into industry or go into other areas? And it's a very similar idea. The skills that you develop are amazingly applicable and you wind up surprised at what you can do. Um, when I was a physics major, I remember my senior year at MIT, the physics major list started getting emails from big financial firms in New York who all for some reason wanted to hire us and we were baffled but then realized that they were saying if you can figure out quantum physics I'm sure you can figure out financial models and it was less the quantum and more the fact that we learned problem solving and in other fields you learn programming you learn how to manage research groups you learn how to write grants so especially in something like aerospace engineering the skill set that you develop is something that a very wide array of people are going to be really impressed by and really interested in hiring you for. So I wouldn't think of it as narrowing at all. It's just sort of a focused way of developing some really valuable skills. Thanks. Thank you so much. We're going to close our panel today. So, but our panelists will be around during the speed mentoring session. Um, so I'm sure if there was a few people that had come down that weren't able to ask their questions, so um, you'll be able to uh, chat with them. Uh, I'm sure, as we move on at the end of the day. Uh, but just to close the session, I was wondering if you guys had any closing remarks, thinking about um, your, when you were in high school, reflecting back on that time, what is the key message you would um, like to leave um, the ladies in this room with today? Maybe, Jesse, if I start on that side, I'll start on this side. Well, just kind of recapping on, on things I've already said, um, like, that you might see barriers, but again, they're perceived. Um, you'll have ups and downs. It'll be a lot of hard work, but follow your dream, and and you know you you'll get there. You'll get there one day, and when you do, it's just going to be incredible. What I would say is, uh, wake up every day to do something that you love. 
so that every day is a great day. And whatever that is, but just make sure that you love what you do and you, you'll be fine. I think going back to the question about um, having many passions and many things that you're interested in, um, never feel like it's too late to pursue any of them. So I think sometimes you start your career at a very young age making decisions for the rest of your life and then maybe five years down the line you're like, oh, like was this the right thing for me? And then you're kind of scared or limited on how you want to make that change. But um, someone when I was just starting university said, that, said to me that you know, wherever your place is in society, you'll find that place. So whatever job you're going to have, somehow you'll get there. And even if it's not where you're at right now, maybe in 10 years, if, if you're meant to be making furniture, you'll, be, you'll figure out how to get there and you'll be making furniture because that's what you love. So just don't be scared to make that change even though that's probably one of the scariest changes to make. And I think what I'd say is I know um, sort of the late years of high school can be, and I think it's easier for some of us, to, easy for some of us to get this, it can be a really stressful and really sort of, it feels like a very weighty time because you're making decisions that are going to matter for a long time and those decisions can be very difficult. And my advice is to not try to contain yourself in a box and not try to be dictated by the barriers that you were talking about since so many of them are conceived and not real and really step back and think about what you would want to work on that would make you push through the failures and the crying and the sort of temporary exhaustion from work and what you really want to drive yourself to do and then go ahead and pursue that. And if somebody's telling you you can't or that it's, an imp it's impractical, don't listen to that. Listen to what you think is going to drive you the most. Awesome. Thank you so much, ladies, for your great insights today. Our final speaker of the morning is the Director of Engineering Services at Mars Green Consulting, a company that she founded. From 2014 to 2015, she was mission commander for a NASA-funded eighth-month Mars simulation in Hawaii. And in 2017, she made it to the final 72 candidates in the Canadian astronaut selection process. So please join me in welcoming Martha Lenio. All right, thank you all for having me here today. Um, I'm here to talk about bright features in STEM, um, features being plural. There's a lot of different things that you can do with a STEM degree. So we'll touch on a few of those today. And we're gonna start basically where you guys kind of are now. Um, in grade nine, you get to high school and people start asking you, what do you wanna be when you grow up? Like how many people actually know right now what they wanna be when they grow up? Yeah? Like, that's pretty good. That's pretty good. Um, so, you know, in grade nine, I said, you know, I, I think I'd like to be an astronaut. Um, and credit to all the people in my life around me at that time, people looked at me and said, you know, I think you could do that. I think if you tried hard, you could actually be an astronaut. And I said, oh, okay. Maybe this is, like, actually a career path I could follow. Um, so it's not like other degree or other, other jobs, I guess. Like, there's no set career path to being an astronaut. You don't go to astronaut school. Um, it's not like if you want to be a lawyer, you go to law school. If you want to be a doctor, you go to med school. There's not really an astronaut school. Um, so you could be a fighter pilot. You could go into the military. You could be a doctor and get your medical degree. Uh, you could be an electrical engineer, a physicist. Um, so I looked at all the various backgrounds of astronauts that you know, have been selected, and one of the things that came up a lot was engineering electrical and mechanical engineers. I had no idea what engineering was in high school. Uh, there's no engineers really in my family. I don't have um, anyone kind of in that field. I didn't know what an engineering job really meant. But I thought, hey, it sounds really hard. It uses math and science. Um, if the spaceship breaks in space, I'd like to be able to fix it. So I'll give this like maybe mechanical engineering a shot. 
So um, I went to the University of Waterloo for uh, my mechanical engineering undergrad. Uh, one of the wonderful things about Waterloo is that um, it has a very unique co-op program. You go to school four months, work four months, school four months, work four months. So over the course of your undergrad degree, you've got a chance to try out up to six different engineering jobs. Um, so I, those are the companies that I worked for in undergrad. Um, Bud Automotive, which is a car manufacturing plant that was down in uh, Kitchener. MD Robotics, which is the company that builds the Canadarm for the space station and uh, the shuttles. Comdev, which is in Cambridge, which is a satellite component company. The Forschungszentrum Karlsruhe in Germany, so I got to do materials um, research at a research institute in Germany for four months. Intermodal Engineering is a uh, sustainable building company doing consulting engineering. Based, uh, they started in Kitchener and Siemens Westinghouse in Hamilton that does gas turbine engines. So I got to try a whole bunch of different types of engineering jobs in different streams of engineering from like research to manufacturing to consulting and kind of get a feel for what those different jobs meant. Um, during that time, you've also got a really awesome opportunity in undergrad to join clubs and get involved in different things that you've never had a chance to before. So I was in the free flight glider team, so you can see on the bottom right there, I joined the free flight glider team in my first year of undergrad. Um, we also started a space club at the university that's still going strong today. So if you go to UW, you could join the Waterloo Space Society. Um, so my friends up in the top right corner there, uh, Melissa Battler, who will come again later, and I started that club. And we would do different things too, like there was like rocket competitions and the free flight glider competition, but we'd also do like astronaut training kind of things. So we did skydiving. So we did, we would take people out to go skydiving. We started like ground school training for getting your pilot's license, um, doing the classes at the university. So it was easier for students to do that if that's something they wanted to do. Um, and then you get to your end of your engineering degree. And I kind of came to a turning point, like, okay, I've got my engineering degree now. What do I want to do with my life? <laughs> it came up again. This question seems to come up about every four years or so for me. Um, one of the things that I learned from working in the aerospace industry was that a lot of aerospace companies, while they work on really cool stuff for space, they can also be bidding on defense contracts. So when I was at Condev, they were building, um, bidding on the missile defense contracts. Um, the work, if you're doing like building rockets that go to space, those, that same type of work can be used on intercontinental ballistic missiles that could bomb another country. So I was like, do I really want to be in this field? Especially when, realistically, my chances of being an astronaut are very small. Is this what I want my life work to be? Um, well, you know, there's other ways, again, of becoming an astronaut. I don't need, don't need to be an aerospace engineer um, to build rockets in order to be an astronaut. You could also do, say, something like solar energy. The International Space Station is, you know, powered by solar power. If you go to Mars, you'll probably be powered by solar power on the planet. Um, and that's also something that's really needed on Earth. Global warming is one of the big fights of, you know, our genera generation. This is the big challenge of our times. I could also be working on solar energy. That's something that's also be needed in space, but it's also something that if I don't become an astronaut, uh, and this is my life's work, is making better, more efficient, cheaper solar cells and bringing them out to the world, this is something I can still really feel good about as something I've worked on in my life. So that was a really big um, part of my decision making. And then I also took a bit of a detour since I was kind of shifting my whole career. You're going to see travel come up a lot. Um, turns out physics is the same all over the world. Mathematics is the same all over the world. Science is, you know, similar all over the world. So um, I took six months off. I was a volunteer teacher in Ghana, um, teaching math and science to year three and four kids there. Uh, and this is probably one of the best decisions I've ever made in my entire life. Uh, again, uh, you, it broadens your perspective. You get to see how other people are living, how the way that we live here in Canada isn't necessarily like the right way to live or the only way to live, um, and really broadens your mind to the challenges that other people face too. Um, and just the people there were so happy and so welcoming. Um, it, this was like, I was like, any, anytime I like smell like diesel and humidity now, like this way it smelled in Ghana, I was like, that was my idea of happiness. I'm like, oh, it smells like happiness here. So Ghana, this is a wonderful, wonderful experience. And then, 
I came back to Canada and really started to focus on the sustainable engineering aspect of mechanical engineering. So I went back to Intermodal, where I had uh, one of my co-op placements in undergrad. Uh, this is one of their projects. This is Okotoks in um, just near Cal Calgary in Alberta. This is one of the projects they were working on back in 2005 when I was working there. Um, and this subdivision is 90% solar powered. Between solar thermal, solar like hot water, and solar electrical, you can see all the solar panels kind of on the garages there. Um, it's a 90% solar powered sub subdivision. So these are the kind of different engineering challenges uh, that would come across their doorstep and that we'd get a chance to work on. Um, after about a year at Intermodal, I was like, you know, a lot of, I've still got this astronaut goal at the back of my mind. And I was like, well, a lot of astronauts also have higher degrees. Maybe I should do a master's or a PhD or something in renewable energy somehow. Uh, and which brings us to turning point number two. <laughs> so now we have, I had been thinking about the back of my mind, um, continuing my education. I was looking at schools in Canada, and there was not a lot of compelling research going on in the area of solar power in Canada at that time. Um, my sister, one of my sisters finished her undergrad and really wanted to do this working holiday visa thing in Australia. Uh, you can get a one-year visa, work and travel, um, but none of her friends wanted to go. She didn't really want to go alone, so I thought, you know, I could do a master's in Australia. A master's like a year and a half. She'll be there a year. Um, and as soon as I looked into schools in Australia, it turns out one of the top research institutes in the world for photovoltaics um, is in Sydney, Australia. Uh, so I went down to Australia. The first time I met my supervisor, he said, you know, you've got good marks. You've got a good resume. You don't need a master's, just do a PhD. And I was like, okay, I want to do a PhD anyways. So I ended up staying in Australia four years and uh, doing my PhD in photovoltaic manufacturing, so making solar cells from scratch. Uh, so you can see here that these are some photos that, uh, from my PhD degree down in Australia. Um, it's very, uh, okay, I have a question for you guys. Does anyone know what a diode is? That's okay. I didn't know either. It, I went, the very first course I went to in Australia um, for solar, they're like, oh, don't worry about solar cells, they're easy. It's just a diode. And I was like, oh God, I don't know what a diode is. This is some like electrical engineering thing that I've never heard of before in my life. I don't know how diodes work. Um, so there was a bit of a steep learning curve, but um, you know, I, I worked at it, I learned it, I took the courses. Uh, after about six months making solar cells in the lab, I was training other people to also make solar cells. Um, we were making high efficiency devices using cheaper technologies. So um, one of the ways they make computer chips is like using photolithography. That's the same way that they make all the record breaking solar cells. So my PhD was on how to make these like high efficiency solar cell structures, but using cheaper manufacturing methods like inkjet patterning or lasers and metal plating. So you can see one of the test structures in the top left corner, and then in the bottom left corner there is actually doing like the testing, seeing the electronic properties of it, looking for defects using different testing methods. Um, and at UNSW, it was a fantastic experience because you would do all of these steps yourself. Um, as was mentioned by one of the questions, being an international student is quite expensive. Um, and I hadn't really planned on going down there for four years. So I was working in the labs, maintaining the equipment, um, doing a lot of tutoring for classes, marking for classes, coming up with extra ways of you know, supplementing um, living down there. And because I'd done so much work for the first three years, uh, my fourth year down there, there was an lecturer went on sabbatical, and I was actually offered a full-time teaching position, like basically a professor, professorship almost, lecturer position at the university. Um, so I took on uh, three of the project courses and the solar cells and systems course. And one of the fantastic things that I then got involved with was the solar car. I was supervising the students building the university's solar car. Um, so 12 students reported to me. I went with them on their race from uh, Darwin down to Adelaide, straight across the middle of Australia. Um, and this is very hard, like it was hard work. Um, I was probably working about 
80-hour work weeks, and I was also playing soccer for the university. Um, but it was very, very rewarding. Um, having student, like helping students do their research, helping their projects come to reality, um, lecturing, it, it was a fantastic experience. Um, but again, like it is expensive. Um, I was offered a job in Silicon Valley before I was finished my PhD, and I worked out a deal that I could get one day a week off to work on writing up my PhD, uh, and just work longer hours the rest of the time. And I was thought, okay, actually, I'll work closer to a regular work week. I might actually get my PhD done better if I'm not teaching and supervising and working in the lab, you know, 12, 14 hours a day. Um, so I went, made the decision to go and work in Silicon Valley doing solar cell R&D while also writing up my PhD. So this is one of the labs that I helped set up. I worked for two different companies over that time. Uh, this is one of the solar cell test structures that I was, again, making new metallization techniques to create higher efficiency, cheaper solar cells so that more people can have them you know, on their homes, workplaces, utility scale, um, at a more affordable price. This, again, was a really fantastic point in my career. I did some of the best research here. Um, but then things, again, in life happen that make you turn. Um, so it, after four years in Silicon Valley, I was starting to think again, like, at the back of my mind, I still want to be an astronaut. Is this getting me any closer to being an astronaut? Um, I'm also really far from my family, and in 2013, my father very um, suddenly passed away from a heart attack. At the same time, my mom's mother, my nana, was not doing so well either. So I had to take a really hard look at my life again, and be, is this where I want to be right now? Um, it was, it's really hard to make the decision to, you know, quit your job, move back, um, kind of take a different direction in your career. You kind of feel like you're throwing away eight years or ten years of your work. Um, so I kind of got to a pretty low point, but I made my career bucket list, um, and I thought of all the different things that I'd still wanted to do with my career, and one was still getting a pilot's license, um, maybe working in none of it doing the Tour de Freak, which is a cycling company that specializes in, in cycling across continents. Maybe I'd like to teach English in a French-speaking country to improve my French. Um, maybe I'd like to work in Antarctica, get survival training certified. Um, maybe I'd like to own my own company and be my own boss, set my own projects and hours. Or maybe now it's time to get back into the space industry. So I moved back to Canada. Um, I retrained as a solar installer because there's not a lot of solar manufacturing in Canada. I started my own company doing consulting. And if you remember Melissa, who founded the Space Club with me back in undergrad, around that time she all, she'd posted that uh, this organization called High Seas was looking for candidates to do a Mars simulation mission. Um, so I applied for that. Uh, they were looking, the, the goal of this project is they're looking for astronaut-like candidates. Um, so the NASA can study them. They're going to put us in isolation for four months, eight months, 12 months, and study how our, our team cohesion, our problem solving, our ability to you know, get through that time. In, in the idea that they're trying to prepare for a mission to Mars, they want to figure out how you pick a crew and support a crew that can survive these long duration isolated missions. Um, so I applied, the process was, took about a year. Um, and there was interviews, there was aptitude, online aptitude tests, there were group interviews, and then the final thing was um, a six-day backpacking trip in the Rocky Mountains in Wyoming. Uh, how many of you guys out there go camping or enjoy camping? Awesome. It turns out that is really excellent astronaut training, so you should continue doing that. <laughs> when I went on this trip, I was like, okay, even if I don't get picked, like this is a six-day paid um, camping trip, paid for by NASA, so even if I don't get picked, this is like an awesome opportunity. Um, over the course of this week-long camping trip, everyone kind of got um, a chance to be the leader of the group for a day. We were being observed by the National Outdoor Leadership School um, leaders and by a fellow from the University of Hawaii who was representing NASA. And in our group, there, was, there were three people. One was former military and two were current military. One was in the Air Force. Um, one had been a medical 
officer in Iraq. And I'd assume that one of them would end up being the commander of this mission. Uh, what I learned uh, from this, this six-day course is that the military doesn't actually train people to be leaders. They train people to be really good followers. Uh, so when I was sharing like a tent with one of the fellows, he would never really initiate putting up the tent or putting the water on for dinner or anything like that. But if I asked him to, he would do it with a smile. And I was like, oh, wow, this is super weird. Um, and I'm not, I never had thought of myself as a strong leader up to that point either. I'm more of a kind of like lead from behind, see if people are doing okay, help people who are struggling, and we'll all kind of get to the goal together in the end. What I learned from that experience was that that's a totally valid leadership style. Um, and also, for this kind of long-duration, isolated mission, maybe that's the type of leader that you need. These were all very smart, highly talented, highly motivated people. They don't need me to tell them what they're to do all the time. They're going to do it and do it far better uh, than I could ever ask of them. So maybe they just needed someone who can like, let them go and be their best selves and make sure that we stay on target. Um, so when I was offered the leadership position for this eight-month Mars simulation, um, I actually accepted it and felt that actually for the, you know, one of the first times I felt I was in a role that I was meant to be in. Uh, so you can see on the right there, uh, we were isolated on 8,000 8, meters or 8,000 feet up Mauna Loa, um, running off solar power, no internet. Um, for eight months, living in a dome. If you wanted to go outside, you had to wear a spacesuit, shelf-stable food, the whole deal. And NASA was, we were the guinea pigs for NASA, they were studying us. Um, so that, since then, I've also worked for TDA Global Cycling, uh, and I did, uh, I was an assistant tour director um, for their French Connection tour, cycling from Quebec City down to New Orleans. As, as stated, I started my own solar consulting company called Mars Green Consulting. Uh, randomly, after doing the solar installation course and recertifying in Canada, all of my projects have been in the north, in the Yukon, Northwest Territories, and Nunavut. So that photo there is from Nunavut um, in Iqaluit, where there's going to be a hopefully net zero hotel building in the works. As, as stated, I was also selected for the, uh, made it to the final 72 of the astronaut selection process. Uh, and last year, that involved doing, after a lot of like medical checks and background checks, uh, three and a half days of basically mental and physical boot camp in uh, Montreal. So again, if there are any aspiring astronauts out there, uh, don't neglect your physical activities. It is important. <laughs> I think the one, the one, one of the major things I didn't get through on was I, couldn't, I was one of only two people there that couldn't do a pull-up. <laughs> so turns out upper body strength is important. And I'm also now, in addition to Mars Green Consulting, working for WWF, the World Wildlife Foundation. They have a, uh, like, they're a wildlife conservation organization, um, but one of the biggest threats to wildlife right now is global warming. So one of their overall goals is to get everyone onto renewable energy. I think their, their goal is 100% renewable energy by 2050. So I'm working on helping Nunavut um, achieve its, like, get off diesel, they're 100% diesel right now, and move on to renewable energy. So how was that career built? <laughs> it's kind of all over the place, uh, and I guess I, I just wanted to show that it's, there's not one right way to go through engineering. You, there's a lot of different things that you can be doing. You can be doing teaching, you can be uh, at, at anything from like the elementary school level up to the university level. Uh, you can be doing research, you can be, yeah, working in consulting, um, and what you're doing at each point, it depends on what your interests are, your hobbies and goals, whether you feel that inter industry, like, is socially acceptable from what, what your, your worldview is, your family commitments and your social responsibilities to your community, the, all of those factored in to the decisions that I made around my career. And at the end of the day, there's still, you know, a possibility they're going to do another call for astronauts in four years. So that's still, again, one of the things I'm working for in the back of my mind. So maybe the next thing will be getting a pilot's license or improving my French, but that's all part of the process as well. So thank you all for having me here today. Yeah. <laughs> We do have time for maybe uh, a quick question, if there is one. 
Um, Yes, and actually, while we're just waiting, uh, we can have the mentors maybe uh, head out to set up for our next session. Thanks. Well, I believe also that you're going to be around in the speed mentoring yeah. session, so if there are uh, questions, because in the interest of time, um, maybe you can, you'll be around to have people come up. It's, uh, it's quite the journey that you were on, so <laughs> yeah. I'm sure there's, there's, uh, there's lots of questions. Thank you so much, yeah. uh, Martha. That was a lovely talk. Um, if we could give uh, Martha a thank you again. Thank you. So we've covered a lot, of, uh, a lot of territory today. We've heard some, from so many diverse uh, speakers. Um, also, I wanted to acknowledge our online audience. Thank you for joining us today. Um, we hope you enjoyed the session, um, both for those that are here in-house and um, for those who are online. Feel free to tweet or post about your favorite moments from our sessions today, either using App Perimeter on Twitter or PI Outreach on Facebook. We're now going to conclude our formal component of our conference, so please join me again in thanking all of our speakers and panelists for sharing our, their experiences today. For our audience now that's in the theater, we're going to be moving on to the final session of our morning. The speed mentoring program is next. If you take a look at um, on the back of